on putting together this panel, we uh, first of all thought about the producer advisory committee that we have at CDCB that has been providing extremely uh, good advice and interaction with our board uh, in the past uh, three years. And uh, this has been uh, a very important initiative of the, of the CDCB board to bring more producers into the conversation. And uh, really, uh, from that, those discussions, actually, the program that we have today came from the Producer Advisory Committee, uh, a discussion that we have with them uh, uh, last year. So uh, we are very glad for that. So our first uh, panelist, uh, Lloyd Halterman from Watertown, Wisconsin, and uh, Rosie Lane Holstens. I have a long uh, list of achievements here. Uh, I mean, he has a BS degree in dairy science uh, from U UW Madison. Uh, I will not say the D year, okay, so just to. Uh, graduate uh, of the University of uh, Wisconsin Agribusiness Executive Management Program, uh, Leadership uh, Watertown Program, Executive Program of Ag Producers, Texas and A&M. He was uh, awarded the Hosting Association Progressive Genetic Award 20 years, uh, Hosting Association Progressive Breeder Registry Award uh, 16 years, Hosting Association's Type Advisory Committee from 94 to 2000. Um, also, um, in 1994, uh, U.S. Uh, JC's Outstanding Young Farmer, National uh, Winner, Professional Dairy Producers of Wisconsin founding member, Dairy Business Association board member, uh, treasurer, uh, so on so far. But I will just say that the last one I have in my list here, the Rosie Lane was named U.S. Dairy Sustainability National winner in 2020. So that uh, really brings uh, um, uh, Lloyd and uh, his whole family into a, a different level to, for this discussion. Uh, we also have with us Bill Peck. Oh, I forgot to say that Lloyd was, is a member of the, the Producer Advisory Committee and was the, the chair of that committee for two years. And the, the current chair is Bill Peck uh, from New York. Welcome, Stock Farm. And uh, so Bill has a unique background as he uh, did not return home uh, to the family farm after graduating from, from college. Cornell University. He attended Albany School uh, Law School, worked as a legis legislative aide, then put uh, his advanced education to use as a lawyer practicing environmental law. So also, uh, he can bring that uh, uh, aspect. I, I try to be friends with Bill because uh, you know, you know, uh, <laughs> it's dangerous not to to do that. Um, so, but after. 20 years, he decided to go back to the farm and his full-time uh, dairy farmer uh, taking care with his brother of the, uh, of the family farm. Um, so he also has participated in many committees like the host and genetic advancement, com advancement committee. And he has been in our uh, uh, producer advisory committee f uh, f one year and a half now. So Bill is the current uh, chairman of the committee. We will also have a recording uh, of uh, Mike McCloskey. Unfortunately, Mike couldn't be here. Uh, Mike is a co-founder and the past CEO of Select Milk Producers, one of the highest uh, dairy cooperatives in the, in the country. He's also chairman of the board uh, for Fair Oaks Farms, which is a popular agritourism attraction located uh, in Indiana. Uh, Mike and his wife, Sue, are the founders of Fair Life, that was mentioned already this morning. Um, and uh, <clears throat> now it's a company that owned by Coca-Cola. Uh, Mike uh, is a partner in Curtis Creek Dairy Farms, which milks 15,000 cows living in three stall barns, in addition with two, 12 robot 800 milking cow barn in uh, Indiana as well. Curtis Creek Dairy Farms harvest their cow manure and use the digesters to create electricity that powers their farms and create bio-based CNG 
to fuel 42 milk trucks, uh, uh, milk trucks yeah. So that uh, displaced 2 million gallons of diesel annually. Uh, and Mike also serves as the chair of the Sustainability Initiative for Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. So we will be playing later uh, a recording that Mike did for us from Puerto Rico. He was there. He couldn't get out after the uh, natural uh, uh, disasters that we had there. Anyways, I will start uh, with uh, Lloyd and Bill and ask a question uh, that you can uh, take to, to start uh, talking with the audience. What have you been doing at your farm towards more sustainable dairy farming? So tell, tell us a little bit about your experience. We'll have to be sharing microphone because the battery of the other died. I have two slides to put up. And I want to show some progress. We've been breeding for net merit as our primary selection index since its introduction in 1994, and before that we focused more on PD dollars. But uh, I think net merit is the sustainability index, and I'm going to put up some just herd metrics from our herd. Uh, we're milking 1,800 cows now, and just to show the uh, world we kind of live in as far as uh, what the um, what the goals are. So the goal, I couldn't have put it any better than Kristen put it this morning. I think everything she said was right on the right track. Um, we're not measuring methane or carbon on our farm yet because nobody seems to know how to tell, tell us how to do it. So, um, but we plan on, you know, so what we've done so far is using an index that's been around since 1994. And, uh, so I want to just show you that 14 years of progress, okay? So this is 2007 compared to 2021, and these numbers I'm getting from the Cornell Pro Dairy, uh, some numbers are from Enlight, and some, some of the numbers are off our financials. Um, you can see that even though our herd size grew, our fat and protein improved, our vet cost, look at the vet cost. In 14 years, we reduced it by down to a third. Now, one of the things we brought a lot of that in-house, we don't have a veterinarian, but we do our own foot trimming, we do our own ultrasound. Um, but you have to have healthy cows to achieve that. Services for conception, we've improved the repro, the stillbirth percentage, and most importantly, I don't know if you can see this in the back of the room, this is last year's number, 1.67 pounds of energy corrected milk for every pound of dry matter intake that the milking herd consumed. And we're measuring that every month, okay? Anybody know? Um, Jason Karzis tells me that, that they expect the U.S. average to be around 1.5. Every hundredth of a point is worth $11 last year per cow per year in net farm income. Every hundredth of a point. Okay, so when we talk about feed, and we, none of the feed efficiency research was done on our farm. This was done by reducing cow frame size. Okay, so from about 94 to 2014 in that 20 year period, we reduced our, our cull cow size, and that's the only way we had to measure. We actually, our sale barn ke keeps records of every cull cow that goes through their barn. We reduced our cow size by 200 pounds, yet our production in every metric went up and our cows are healthier, less DOAs, better fertility. Uh, put up the next slide. I want to show you the other thing I really strongly believe in, okay? We're talking about genetic progress and we all want to make genetic progress. I think we're in too big of a hurry. We have to get these cows to last. Cows down here in eighth and ninth lactation produce almost as much energy corrected milk and more than two and three year olds, okay? These cows, actually last year's numbers on this would have shown that our highest lactation group was our fifth lactation cows. And it had been that way for two years. Um, I didn't have this report until about two years ago when we, uh, Bovisink people 
made this report for me because I thought it was really important. The other thing is uh, the call cost per hundred weight. Let's just, and that's theoretical, let's just assume that you turned over 100% of your cows and you milked all two-year-olds. Your call cost per hundred weight, when you compare to feed and energy, labor, 535, you get those cows down here, this cow only costs 53 cents a hundred weight to replace. Did you know that net herd replacement cost is the leading indicator in the United States of profitability? Farm credit did research. Net herd replacement cost separates the winners from the losers financially in the U.S. dairy industry. So you can't, you know, again, call cost per hundred weight, and the call rate. You can get down, our goal is to get somewhere down here. We think we get the 15% turnover rate will be really profitable. Okay, so using net merit, which has been around a long time, um, I'm going to go with the science. Uh, the reason I screwed up too, a couple of years ago, we used some bulls that were a little lower on DPR. Here's my other lesson. What does it take for a cow to get to be old? DPR. They don't breed back. I think uh, open cows is the leading reason of culling around the world. Not sick cows, not lame cows, not mastitis cows, open cows. So not enough focus in my mind, not enough focus on DPR. So that's really uh, real quick. If you had any questions about any of the numbers, you can poke holes in it. It's, it's our herd metrics and our numbers, but it, we want to operate down in fourth and fifth lactation, and our goal is to only have 15% of our herd be two-year-olds. Questions for Lloyd before he gives up the mic. Right. Yes. Um, how many days in milk do you breed your cows on average? Uh, two, okay, voluntary. the question was uh, voluntary waiting period. Our two-year-olds, so we have a strategy about this. Our two-year-olds were breeding at, uh, 72 days, and our older cows at 93 or 94 days. The reason we're doing that, we want to get more milk. We can, we can stand a little longer lactation down here. We need to get these cows, the third calf, as fast as humanly possible. Okay? So we want them to calve at 23 months, and we want them to calve again at, a year later. So we can... There's a, little more, there's a little more room for error down here. But again, look at the leading. We've been breeding for productive life and we really had a big intensity on DPR. That you can see that's really paying off. Uh, the other thing to notice, when you get down here, you almost have a 50% call rate in those lactations. That's a problem that we're trying to rectify genetically and the other thing about the U.S. sustainability thing, we, when they asked us to apply for that, it really didn't have a lot of measures other than our cow measures. And we did it with genetics, it being uh, to breed healthier cows, to breed cows that calved on their own. We only pull one out of 52 calves um, or assist. And so that's a little long answer, but... Okay. I'll turn, it, I'll turn it slightly over to we're, sustainability. We're, yeah, we're going we to <laughs> we're going to have uh, Bill now, and then uh, the move, and then we will have the questions at the end of the panel. So we'll turn off the the lights here. So Bill, the floor is yours. Yeah. So good morning, Bill Peck. Welcome, Stock Farm. Uh, when he gives the introduction, really, I'm just a dad and a husband, and uh, chase a bunch of kids around and enjoy farming, enjoy genetics. Um, but sustainability, we brought it up a year ago as, as a topic because obviously it's, it's front and center in the press. It's front and center in the consumer, it's front and center from the buyers. And as I think about what we've done, and I'll touch on those, but I've been talking for several years that, you know, I think the, the cows have been getting beat up in the, in the public eye. And I think the cows can be the savior of the, of the earth and the planet because of what we can do, what the, what the science is for methane digestion and scrubbing and making re renewable natural gas. Now, surprisingly, and I'll, before I get into that, I'll just say 
we milk a thousand cows. We crop about two thousand acres. My brother uh, handles the cropping side uh, facilities. I handle genetics, uh, labor, um, finance, that type of things. But but we work together as a team, and we have a passion for genetics. We uh, for the folks that are in here, it's uh, prefixes are welcome, welcome tell, and uh, Bacon Hill. And I have no greater belief that the greatest gain we've made in sustainability in the last 40 and 50 years has been genetic gain. You know, we've done a lot in, in, in management and in environmental, uh, uh, environmental circumstances on the farm, but genetic gain, you know, we got geneticists in the room here. And we all have to work together and thank you for the, for the science and research base that we, the gain we've made in the in dairy industry. But I just, uh, when we talk about uh, sustainability, one of the things that was mentioned here several times that maybe some geneticists in the room don't know that the FAR, FARM program is, uh, is a multi-module program about how you manage your dairy. And in order for us, I'm an Agrimark member, which is in the Northeast, which is a member of the National Milk Producers Federation. All co-op members that are members of National Milk have to follow the FAR program. So that deals with herd health, that deals with labor management and how we train those folks to, uh, to handle cattle. That deals now, what they touched on the environmental module. That deals with the carbon footprint. Now, we continue to be challenged, and, and, and Lloyd does such a fantastic job. You wanna, we could spend the uh, next three hours dissecting Lloyd's farm in numbers uh, because he's done a great job at being a dairyman in Wisconsin. And, uh, uh, but I'm going to touch on the renewable natural gas. You know, I think there's a congresswoman in, in New York City that came out when she first started running and that she thought the cows, the dairy cows, were the detriment to the planet. They were going to kill the planet. And I just wish that she, uh, she knew how little she knew at the time she was making that comment. And, you know, we look at renewable natural gas. Uh, at our farm, we do a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of manure management under the CAFO plan, nutrient management, precision planning to reduce our fertilizer. We do uh, things from a genetic standpoint to make greater efficiencies. And then we, we don't do this yet. We've been looking at uh, digesters and renewable natural gas that can, and that's why Mike McCloskey couldn't be here. We can all look to Mike and see what he's done. Mike has like been a leader in this, compressed natural gas. If you go to his uh, farm, you can see uh, the operation that he's got running his vehicle his trucks, his, you know, those are, that's what we can do in the dairy industry. It takes a lot of innovation, it takes a lot moving forward, but those are things that we can do. Renewable natural gas, we can eat, heat homes, we can, we can do uh, drive vehicles, but surprisingly, the environmental community is against it because they don't want any natural gas because it encourages, encourages fossil fuel natural gas as well. So there's a variety of things we can look at. Um, but from our farm, his farm and our farm, we've tried to do a better job of being stewards of the land. I think that was a great term. I'm a sixth generation dairy farmer. I tell people my only obligation in life is to make sure that the seventh generation can choose. That we have a profitable business that stays in business so they have the opportunity to choose. And that's why I do it. Good morning. Uh, I apologize that I could not be there in person, uh, but it's a true honor and a pleasure to be with you today just to share a little bit about what's um, what our quest in the dairy industry in regards to sustainability has been. So in 2007, uh, we got together as a dairy industry and, and uh, <clears throat> formed the Innovation Center. And by 2012, uh, we had a very clear understanding of what our life cycle assessment was of, of, of a gallon of milk. And what are the areas that we needed to work on uh, to be able to reduce and meet that commitment by 2050 of getting to net zero as an industry? Um, why is sustainability important? Well, I mean, just the first is just it's doing the right thing, right? It's taking care of our planet in many different ways. It's taking care of our animals. It's taking care of our people. It's taking care of our land. So it's just the right thing to do. On the other side, 
uh, it's an incredibly competitive issue that we as an industry have to deal with. Uh, they are, we compete with many other alternative products, as we all know, and we have to make sure that we keep our place very strongly at the table. We have the most wholesome, nutritious product out there. I have no doubt about that. But if we can't meet all the other expectations of our consumers, then uh, we may find ourselves uh, not being able to compete so well at that table. So it's very important that the consumer looks at our industry, looks at dairy farmers, looks at that gallon of milk or pound of cheese that they were purchased as a very sustainable, responsible product. So if we get into what we're all here today to talk about, which is you know genetics and genetics in general have played such an important role on the continuous reduction of greenhouse gas emissions over the years, uh, as you know, the just from a productivity point of view, uh, it has been impactful what we have been able to do from a carbon intensity point of view. Because uh, when you're looking at looking at, at carbon reduction from an intensity point of view, you're measuring it against a specific unit. In this case, you're measuring against a gallon of milk. Uh, as our cows become more productive, as our cows have become healthier uh, through genetic improvements, uh, we have been able to dramatically uh, reduce the intensity of a gallon of milk. And that's been great. And we will continue to do that uh, without a doubt. And that's very important on the quest to get to net zero. But at the end of the day, it is the absolute measurement of methane emissions that allows you to get to net zero. And we need to work through genetics on several areas that create absolute reductions of methane. And uh, I think there's two great areas. Uh, one is uh, really focused on, on a lot of work that's being done already, which is uh, the ability of feed conversion into milk. And uh, uh, I think there's some great things happening there and some great identification through genomics coming uh, to all of us very soon. If not some, uh, I believe some of us are already using that, but I believe that this will get better and better. So we will have a lot better feed conversion in our animals. We'll have a lot better productivity that will actually result in some absolute reduction uh, added to the intensity reduction that we will continue to have. I think the bigger one and the bigger challenge and the, and the you know, thought that I would like to leave here today is to be able to work on identifying those cows that genetically have the ability to be equally productive, but they uh, are producing less methane. And what that I think the first thing we need to find out is what is the range that ex that's out there of cows that uh, that that are high methane producers and low methane producers, while on a comparative basis basis being equal in productivity. Um, once we identify that range, that will give us a kind of an idea of the size of the prize uh, as far as getting into the genomics of being able to identify those lower methane emitters. So there's a two-stage process here. Uh, I'm hoping that that range will be very attractive to us uh, as other ranges have been in the past in, in, in genomics. I, I, I really have expectations that that range will uh, uh, light a fire under us to be able to continue to identify then those cows that genomically will produce and stay at the same level of productivity and continue to improve productivity while at the same time they bring a genetic predisposition to produce less methane as they, as they continue to increase their productivity. So that's a challenge I leave you with. I, I hope you continue to have a great meeting. And uh, again, I apologize that I wasn't there in person, but uh, thank you for taking out a little time to listen to me. Uh, buyers and, and processors uh, and uh, retailer and they 
basically set the uh, the floor that well, this is real. This is already here. We're not uh, talking about something for the future. Uh, we have already a value uh, added to this uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, environmentally efficient uh, uh, milk production. But do you see that the production sector is already in the same pace? Uh, and if not, what do we need to do? What will be the, the driver to get uh, most of our dairy producers uh, to buy the concept of uh, sustainability? Well, I think m many of them are buying into it now. I think the dairy industry as a whole has uh, bought into the need for sustainability. It's the right thing to do, but really our lives are dictated on it. If we don't have buyers, then we don't have farms. And we're being told, uh, you know, that we, these are processes that we need to do. The challenge is going to be getting to net zero. I mean, let's not, let's not skirt around it. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's going to take innovation. Now, some farms, it's going to be very difficult. So like all progress or, or as the future rolls on, there becomes less and less of us. And all these added things become more challenging, more costly. And if we can't return a profit on those, we end up out of business. Uh, but I think the dairy industry as a whole is bought in. I think, you know, I, I can't go back to it enough, the genetic side of this, the gains that are made, because this is what excites me. What, when Mike talked about the methane, you know, if we can start calculating uh, in genetics the methane uh, amounts, you know, we're taking another step. We're, we, these are all small steps to a cumulative issue that we need to work toward. I envision, you know, a closed loop system on dairy farms. Anything you bring into your, uh, this goes back to the old uh, factories and environmental issues. When anything you bring into your site gets used on site or reused. We don't really create waste. We create fertilizer. We create breading. We create, you know, these types of things. So that's going to all help toward our lowering our carbon uh, footprint. The, the number I heard this morning that scares me to death was when uh, the cheesemaker said for a $5.6 billion worth of product it costs $5.6 billion to process it. We have a real cost structure problem in our industry. That means we're going to have to have a premium product. It's going to cost more than chicken and pork and our competitor proteins. That's the way it sounded to me. Our plant proteins have so, so we have to be really competitive. So why aren't the cheesemakers asking us to breed our cows for double B kappa casein, which could improve the plant output of every cheese plant in America if they took in all double B? Uh, our genetic uh, goal, I guess I should state, is black and white jersey with twice the yield, Neil. So, so uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I put our feed efficiency numbers up against the jersey. So, um, but. So I, I think we have to get these costs down, and we're going to do it through genetics. And by breeding for net merit, it gave us the ability for the last 10 years, we have not treated a lactating cow in our herd with antibiotics. And we use dry treat at the end, and we use antibiotics in our calf barns. So that was where we started, is on the milking herd. And we're having great, you see the results are pretty good. So. That's, so so we, we I think we just have to grind out efficiencies. Yeah. We have a question from the audience here that uh, is uh, very much related to what uh, uh, you were saying here. Let's see how, how you, you react to that. Has increased focus on sustainability been more profitable than selection for other traits? Well, I'll just touch on, we haven't necessarily... Uh, you know, it's twofold. Sustainability is a bigger concept. And um, we haven't bred for sustainability per se. We've bred for efficiencies in breeding, in uh, uh, production. In, and for us, and it was mentioned earlier, it really comes down to it's not really about fluid milk. It comes down to pounds of protein, pounds of fat, increased components. Uh, now, what we want is a lot of milk with really high components because that gives us the greatest volume. Um, so the the... Long answer, I guess, to this is, you know, we haven't been breeding for sustainability. That's something we're, I think, as an overall pitcher, uh, as a goal, we've been breeding for efficiencies that make us profitable, keep us in business, and many of these things roll into sustainability. 
can I go first? Yeah. Um, I would um, agree with everything Bill said. We didn't really breed for sustainability, but I have a real belief that if you want your cows to last a long time, you breed for productive life. Leading reason of culling in the world is open cows need breed for DPR, and you can see I didn't perfectly line it up too good, but you do those things and you, it, it goes a long way. Uh, I have the microphone now, thank you. It's on. It's on. Okay, uh, sustainability is a wonderful idea. It's, it's wonderful that we're getting more efficient all the time. However, the three largest polluters in the world, China, India, and Russia, are laughing at us. They're getting richer and we're getting poorer. And in 10 years, if we don't change our ways, China is going to own the USA. And Bill Gates and China already own more rural land than anybody else in the United States. So this is a nice idea, you know, to be more efficient all the time. But we have a tremendous amount of oil under the ground. It's not fossil fuel, it's oil. It's the second largest thing in the, in the world, except for water. We have an unlimited amount of oil. But no, we're not pr producing it. We're buying it from Venezuela and Russia and OPEC. What the hell's going on with this country? It's, it's, it's disgusting. I'll just hit on, on one of the things. You, you make good points, Ron. And, uh, you know, we need to be competitive in the international uh, platform. And, you know, some of, these, some of our regulatory requirements here in this state, whether it be... Uh, manufacturing, whether it be on agriculture, whether it be labor, make it more costly to do business here. Now, I will challenge uh, those in this room and, and, and really those in our federal government that the most important thing we got to make sure we do here in the U.S. Is, is food security. I've been talking about it for 25 years, and I've really in the last three, three to five years here become a talking point now in the U.S. Senate. Uh, feed, food security and making sure that the people in this country have enough food to, uh, to feed this country is going to be very important. And more importantly, that we don't concentrate it in one area of the country, let alone because of man-made or natural disaster. We need to have a thriving agricultural economy in all sectors of this country uh, in order to, uh, number one, feed our people, sustain our people. And if we start chasing around the world, uh, for food to protect our food supplies the way we've done oil over the last 30 years we will be in a very difficult position But as far as uh, the larger political uh, scenario, you know it, It's those are some real serious issues and if we can't but but I also don't believe in Globalization that we all are you know the, the rights of the US and the, the sovereignty of the US are greater than than uh, forming some type of global uh, governmental entity, which will be worse. But we have challenges. But right now, in sustainability, what we need here in the U.S. is because we have consumers that are driving it. We have consumers that are telling us, this is what we want, this is what we need. And if you don't provide it that way, then you won't be, you won't be in business serving them. Let me ask uh, the next question to Lloyd. Uh, I know because Lloyd is very good with numbers, so this is perfect for him. Can you speculate on what economic value emission reduction should uh, be to, uh, to make a difference in profitability in the farm? I don't have a clear-cut answer. I guess Kristen had a slide up on her screen this morning, and that would be research-based. So that would be a lot better number than I would have to tell you. Um, but it's going to have value because I don't think that sustainability costs. I think we're going to make more money from sustainability and improving our sustainability. You can just look at our herd metrics. As we became more sustainable, according to the definitions this morning, we're making more money. We're making more money, not less. It's not a cost, it's an investment. Just like semen, right? There's the cost side to it, but it's not a cost, it's an investment. And it's going to carry forward. So that's what I don't know, I guess I'd just defer to the slides we had this morning. I mean, that, that is a lot better than the answer I can give you. Well, start, speaking of that, the next question says, Kristen showed that fertility is important for sustainability, but Lloyd showed that DPR is still a challenge. 
so should we do more to improve our fertility traits? I would say yes. We're not even close to where we need to be. Uh, we do double off-sync on our farm, and when Milo Wiltbank came out and helped us set that up, he told me something that just shocked me. Uh, it'll take seven generations of intensive breeding for, re for uh, fertility to get back to where we were in the 1970s for cow fertility. Seven generations of intensive breeding. But, so that sent shock waves across me and I, I mean it's like we have to get these cows more fertile. Leading reason of culling and culling is the leading metric for farms that are winners and farms that are losing money. So it, it's pretty simple whether you want to believe it or not. It's, pre it's really pretty simple. If your cows get bred back, res resist mastitis and don't go lame, you're going to make money. Okay, it's that simple. Uh, DPR is a number that actually works. The, uh, you can see that in our herds. If you breed for DPR, you get cows pregnant. Now, in general, we need to balance everything. You know, <laughs> this is what I talk about in a lot of areas, but it's really what it is, whether it be net merit, TPI, uh, DWP dollars. It's about putting different weights on various characteristics, and it's about coming out with the best product, most efficient cattle at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, the fertility is an uh, absolutely enormous amount of uh, concentration in this country. Time is spent on it uh, to get cows more fertile, whether it be a synchronized program or just spending time in your barn and catching, catching heats, uh, which is uh, still the way I like to do it. Um, so fertility is important, and DPR is a trait that actually you can see direct results. But it's one trait in a variety of things that need to be balanced in order for us to move forward. Questions? If not, I'm going to ask. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, Joost van Jerenbrink. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, in Holland, we've done a lot of research on feed efficiency, so I was wondering, question for you, Lloyd. Uh, you mentioned that you had a, a feed efficiency of 1.6, if I remember well, 1.68. Uh, do you also know the variation you have with, uh, within your herd between the cows? Because I think um, it was Mike who made a comment with for, for methane emission that there is a, a need to see the variation, but do you also know it for feed efficiency? We don't. We don't know the measure, except that I can tell you that the least uh, feed efficient cows on our farm beside is our two year olds spending too much too many too much feed to grow and get to their mature body size and which leads to less production. Their dry matter intakes are less too, but um, I don't know because we don't have the ability to measure cow to cow. We don't have the technology to measure I guess um, you know the feed efficiency research being done by uh, rel uh, residual feed intake would be a good start on that. Um, so, but we've been measuring that feed efficiency since 2007 when we started putting our numbers into the Cornell Pro Dairy Program, and it's really eye-opening. As uh, the other thing to reduce methane, we always say we feed a high grain diet. 45, only 45 percent of our diets forage. It produce less methane, and every time. We increase the forage in our diets, um, our cost goes up and our margins go down. And um, that's just the opposite of what we all want to hear, right? We all want to hear about these cows that can do it all on high forage diets and this low cost forage. No such thing as low cost forage. No such thing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a fairy tale, okay? Uh, no, nobody can show me that they can get this done as cheap as they think. Fastest way to reduce yield on a farm, put in a scale. Okay, so fastest way to reduce yield, put in a scale. Thank, thank you for your answer. Uh, so just, just to give uh, some, some comments, what we've seen in the research in Holland is that with that uh, average, the variation between cows is from 1.1 to 2.2. So there is a wide scale in variation uh, within cows to gain. This morning. I would agree with that. You know, you know what the least feed efficient cows are? Sick ones. You're feeding them and they produce a big fat zero. 
okay? The only way you can achieve this 1.68 or 1.7 is our goal to consistently achieve that. The only way you can achieve that is to have healthy cows. I haven't talked a thing about breeding for more pounds of fat and pounds of protein, which we do, but our emphasis in our program is to take high net merit bulls and amongst that subset, over $1,000 net merit, of that subset, we're going to pick the high health bulls. We're going to get our money through health because the milk price is going to be stable, and right now it's at a peak, but how many people think the milk price is going up? How many people think pharmaceutical costs are going up and feed costs are going up? Margins are going to condense. Your only, your only chance to widen your margin is, to, is genetics. Just touching on the feed efficiency, those, those data are herd wide. So we've been participating in similar to, to and I haven't got it on, uh, on the top of my head, but the feed efficiency data really is a Cornell return on uh, income over feed costs. You know, what are our returns going to be? And that's a very uh, important indicator in profitability is income over feed costs. What are we putting in? What are we getting out? So the feed efficiency is a, is a valuation of that. We're in an infancy, I think, here in the U.S. Um, in really understanding. There's, there's a lot of research going on, and a lot more needs to be done to, so that we can pinpoint on that haplotype, on that genomic strip, where the feed efficiency and make sure we can nail it down and breed more efficient cows with less methane and so on. Those are, we're, we're just at the beginning. Unfortunately, we... We have to move on with our program, and uh, I would like. To, so, sorry. Okay. What? Well, one last question then. So, uh, Nick Kirby from Great Britain, from a country called Wales. Um, we sat here, and we're sitting here because we're enthusiasts. But globally, I believe, we are in the minority. In our country, in the United Kingdom. Still too many producers are uneducated and do not give a real value to genetics. So it's all very well, all of us sitting here, agreeing with each other. But if we want to affect the consumer, we have to get our colleagues to be educated or understand what the value of genetics really is. What are your thoughts and comments to that comment? One minute each. Genetics are the most valuable thing we have on our dairies. And so, in, you know, educating them, we've, the AI industry has really um, done a great job in, in helping drive the genetic gain in this country or in this world. But then we've treated it like a commodity going out the door. It's uh, selling volume at lowest price. Uh, here in agriculture, we seem to be very good at accepting that, and we need to raise the bar. You know, we do it in our milk production, and we've done it in our semen sales as well. Uh, genetic, uh, you know, we need to educate step by step. That's the salesman on the farm talking to the farmer about what's the value of genetics here today. And, uh, you know, that's an ongoing struggle. Um, but, but I think when you can show the returns, when you show the returns that livability gets you, DPR gets you, you know, then it becomes an easier sell. But so far the mindset's been it's a, it's a low-cost commodity, and we need to change that. Let, let Lori touch on the commodity. Uh, Semen education. Um, I would agree. Problems here. I can only look at my neighbors. They can tell me what every field of corn has for a hybrid on it, but they can't tell me what bulls are using on their dairy herd. And that's a problem. And then they rely on an AI company to sell them. And of course, the semen salesman is going to pick the bull he makes the best margin on. Because, I mean, that's, that's in his best interest, too. And so we're. You know, we need to get the direction straight. And I think some of this is on the processors. The processors, as demanding as we think they are, they're really not. They should be telling us to breed these cows with higher fat, higher protein, kappa casein, maybe A2. I, I mean, I'm just saying that there's a lot of traits and new traits that will be discovered. They should be telling us what they need to make their plants most efficient rather than just, you know, Com straight out commodity. So I, I will invite Ron and the others to approach our panelists after the, the program. We really need to move on. And uh, a round of applause to them. Thank you.